scripture lesson today comes from Ezekiel 37, 1 through 10. The Lord's power overcame me, and while I was in the Lord's spirit, he led me out and set me down in the middle of a certain valley. It was full of bones. He led me through them all around, and I saw that there were a great many of them on the valley floor, and they were very dry. He asked me, human one, can these bones live again? I said, Lord God, only you know. He said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the Lord's word. The Lord God proclaims to these bones, I am about to put breath in you and you will live again. I will put some news on you, place flesh on you and cover you with skin. When I put breath in you and you come to life, you will know that I am the Lord. I prophesied just as I was commanded. There was a great noise as I was prophesying, then a great quaking, and the bones came together bone by bone. When I looked, suddenly there were sinews on them. The flesh appeared, and then they were covered over with skin. But there was still no breath in them. He said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, human one. Say to the breath, the Lord God proclaims, come from the four winds, breathe. Breathe into these, four de- into these dead bodies and let them live. The word of God for the people of God. Let's pray. Dear God, may my words be of you, and those words that are not of you, may those fall upon deaf ears. Amen. Um, Several weeks ago, uh, some of my colleagues and I, some of the young clergy gathered together. The bishop has kind of tasked us with looking over some of the changes that are being proposed at General Conference and, and, and giving some some viewpoints on that, and so uh, we met as a group, and there were about six or seven of us around the table um, at that point. We've met since then as well, but um, the the gentleman who was leading this conversation presented two simple questions. One was, where do you see pain, and the other was, where do you see hope? Well, in a in a room full of clergy, Um, All of us preachers, by the way, uh, so you can't shut us up um, very easily, but we all kept talking about where we saw pain. We had an easy time with where we saw pain, and we we complained a lot, and in fact, it was probably about 30 or 45 minutes of us talking about where we see pain. Well, he tried to get us back on track and said, but where do you see hope? There's got to be hope somewhere, and, and and. we started talking about hope, and we could each think of one or two things and went around the room, and each one of us could think about one or two things. But then eventually it turned back to pain. There's something in us that this has this, this ability to see pain and, and to see worry and to see suffering, and, and we dwell on it so often. And many times it's all that we can feel. If, if you turn on the news, it, it seems that all we can see is destruction and, and people's hearing uh, Christians down and, and persecuting Christians and persecuting others as well. So often that's all we see on the news. And then on top of it, we read survey after survey and, and blog after blog and website after website about people who are saying that the church is declining, that the church has no hope, and that we are going to be dead soon. I, I don't want to gloss over the pain. And I, too, spend time wondering why we're seeing this change in our society and why we're seeing this change in our churches. Did you know that the average um, uh, very faithful, committed church member comes twice a month on average? Twice a month. That's, That's a good Christian. That's one that is very devoted, very faithful, but still can only find their find enough time to come about twice a month. And so every once in a while, someone will come to me and tell me about a problem. And I annoy people a lot because my, my answer to it is always, yes, there is a problem, but where do we see hope? Because we see it so often, we, we dwell on the problem and we dwell and dwell and dwell until we make and create for ourselves the self-fulfilling prophecy where all of a sudden where we, where we see pain and, and where we want to point out the pain, we only see the pain and we no longer see hope. I usually tell them, yes, yes, there's a problem. There's, there's something going on here. But there's also hope. Where do we see that great hope? It's not my intention to be flippant or avoid the problem, but just to redirect so that we, we point ourselves towards where God's grace is growing within this church and within the community and within the world alike. 
Um, I used to write grants for a living. And so one of the most frustrating questions that you can get on a grant is this question. What will you do if you don't have the money? Well, I won't do the program because I don't have the money. If I didn't need the money, I wouldn't be writing the grant. And then the second one is, is where are you successful? Well, I'd be able to be more successful if I had some more money. Um, and it was always the most frustrating question, but one of the things that they're asking for is, where do you already see hope in your program? You see, we want to fuel the hope that already is there, not fuel the pain that's there instead. Well, Ezekiel was a man familiar with a lot of pain. Scripture tells us that he was walking around in a sea of bones, bones everywhere, lifeless bones and, and dry bones, dead bones. And can you imagine how these bones were aching? How these bones must have felt empty of flesh and warmth and life and breath and air. How these bones must have known that no matter what they did, they could not for themselves put on flesh, make lungs for themselves, fill those lungs with air. They needed someone else. They needed a Savior. And, and they must have been thinking at that point, would that Savior ever come? I wonder what made these bones dry in the first place. What did it take for these bones to lose their flesh? What, was it years of decay or was it seconds of burning? Was there once hope for resuscitation and it was lost? How long does it take to lose hope for resuscitation? Lazarus was dead for three days. His body was speaking, as Scripture tells us, and yet he was brought back to life. Is that how long it takes? Does it take three days or four or five before you start to lose hope? You see, in Ezekiel, these, these dry bones represent the house of Israel. They, they represent this community that was scattered around, that, did not, uh, that needed and, and ached for reunification. And so this story is telling us and, and telling the people of Israel that one day they will be reunited. There is hope. These, these tribes of Israel, Israel that are dispersed throughout the land will one day be re reunited. And, and they will not only be reunited as bones, but they will be reunited with flesh and breath and air. These bones are aching for this day, waiting for, until this community that once was will now again be. But for now, they are dry and devoid of hope. And so that's what the scripture is. One day, there will be hope. This isn't the only time that we see this imagery of bones in the Bible. It, um, it occurs in, in uh, Job and in Isaiah. And many times the imagery of bones describe this feeling of being hopeless and helpless. It's, it's that feeling that Job had once he lost all of his entire livelihood and his entire family. And it's a strong visual. We still have hope when the body is warm and we may admit defeat when the body is cold, but when these bones are completely dry, it would seem as if all hope is lost. It's the feeling that you have when everything that you know in the world has been lost and you have left been left abandoned. It's the feeling that you have when you've lost the most important thing in the world to you and, and you don't know that it will ever come back. It's the homeless man begging for food on the street that has lost all hope of finding a job. It's the woman living in poverty who knows the only way to feed her children is to skip a meal herself. The man who lost his spouse, his best friend, his companion. The woman who lost her job, her livelihood, and has nothing left in the bank as a cushion. It's what happens when we not only have hit a bump in the road, but have lost all hope of that bump being repaired. They're dry bones and and even Lazarus had some flesh left on the bones when he was resuscitated. It's not just losing hope, it's, it's losing all promise of it. And, and some of you are pointing at the own bones in your life. Some of you have these bones or you know of someone else who has them. And you're screaming, these bones are dry. But the Lord is asking you to tell them that he will breathe new life into them. He will not abandon even the driest of bones. You see, the way that Ezekiel handles these dry bones is exactly how we should handle it. The Lord asks him, do these bones even have a hope of life? And Ezekiel says, you have that power. Only you have that power. It's up to you. If your will, that is what will be. 
And so God tells Ezekiel to prophesy over the dry bones that God will breathe life into them. We see this again in Isaiah 26, 19 says this, But your dead will live, Lord. Their bodies will rise. Let those who dwell in the dust wake up and shout for joy. Your dew is like the dew of the morning. The earth will give birth to her dead. You see, the promise is there. The dead will live and their bodies will rise. What once had no hope will be breathed life once again. But he does ask for a partner in this. He does ask for Ezekiel to be there as well. You see, God could have easily breathed life into these bones alone. He didn't need Ezekiel to do it. He is God. He has the power to breathe life in whatever and whenever and however he does. And yet he asks Ezekiel to talk to the bones. To remind the bones that life is promised, that despite all odds, despite the missing flesh and the lack of lungs, life is possible. God is still there. God will continue to be there. And God will not abandon. Where do you see dry bones? Maybe they're not in you. Maybe they're just in someone that you know. Where are you looking and pointing to these bones that seem to have no life left? And where have you stopped believing that it's possible for God to breathe life into them? Speak to them. Pray over them. Tell them that God still remains. And then look up to the sky and ask God and tell God that you know that if it is his will, it will be his way. For the only thing better than having flesh on these dry bones is having the flesh of Jesus Christ, the sovereignty of God, and the reminder that it is not our power but God's that provides for bones to walk again. And God's power is so much better than ours anyway. Amen.